Alright, so we're live right now. Shout out to the live stream chat. We got it over there in the corner. We're going to be reacting to Roblox Horror, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly by Dags. Let's check it out. It's 30 minutes long. It's a big one. Let's see what we got. Horror games, especially in the indie scene, have had a strange... Yo, trajectory. thank you for the $500, man. What in the world? Jeez. The past few years. Starting off in the 90s with big publishers sincerely putting out terrifying experiences for their time, yeah. with the accessibility of game creation exploding to heights not seen before. This allowing many aspiring creators to lift passion projects off the ground. In the early days, it was games such as Slender the Eight Pages and the first Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah. The latter, though, would change the scene. Dude, Five Nights at Freddy's is such a good game. It's still one of my favorite horror games of all time. In fact, I think... I think number five, Sister Location, is probably my top three horror games of all time. I love Sister Location. It's so good. In forever. Marketable mascots, confusing lore, merchandise, everything hey, needs to cater to an obviously very young and growing audience. At the same time, another software had been growing in tandem with the rise of mascot horror. This program allowed young- Mascot horror. That's a good name for stuff like Poppy Playtime and FNAF and, and Rainbow Friends. And aspiring developers to put their ideas into action in a more easy way than ever. Roblox had already been a phenomenon by the time the first five Nights at Freddy's came out, and yeah. arguably even by the time the first Slender released. With the game itself already having eight years to mature, the program would become an established empire in the broader gaming landscape by the turn of the decade. And as independent developers would ride the wave of what was and still is trendy in the gaming landscape, Roblox developers would follow. Many of these games not really picking up mainstream appeal outside of their respective niches. As time went on though, we saw somewhat of a renaissance happen for this genre- I see the rock down there! <laughs> Your favorite Roblox horror game? The Rock. Calling The Rock at 3 a.m. <laughs> on the website. Some of the games here even being big enough to join the ranks of more professional indie horror games. Yeah. Even to the point where you could find physical merch of them being sold in stores. With all that being said though, I Speaking of that, Piggy actually has a full-on book. Like, if you go to like a bookstore, there'll be a Piggy book there now. Like, they got toys, they got books, they have everything. It's crazy. They even have a Steam game. It's wild. We are kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Let's take a step back so we can evaluate what even led up to this point. Okay. Chapter 1, The Birth of Roblox Horror. Roblox Dude. and horror have a surprisingly long relationship. Although you can make the argument that horror games have 2006! Oh my god! Half of you guys weren't even born yet! since its inception, the explosion of it being an established genre to the software would come way later. But there were still games meant to genuinely startle you all the way since 2007. Obviously, these games are very primitive compared to what you can do now, but I still do think these serve a place in the history of what we will soon discuss. The first classic Roblox horror game I could find documented was a game called Torture Chamber released all the way in June of 2007. Now, details on this game are super scarce and there's not much information about about it. But as Roblox YouTuber Toasted Cherries had documented before me, the heavily condensed story goes that a group of spooky dead hackers known as spirits would invade- <laughs> It's a hacker game! ...a game called Mini Game World, one of the most popular games on the site for its time period. That was the most popular game on Roblox in 2007? That? Right there? That? Okay. Period. Spirit and many followers would invade this game and cause a little bit of a ruckus doing so, alerting the player base when they were seen in game. The problem apparently got so bad, a group known as the Roblox Spirit Killers, or RSK, was formed. Where this all fits into what we are discussing though, is the game the original Spirit account made, titled Torture Chamber. This game doesn't have many archives of it on the web, with the original being taken down and footage of it being very sparse. From what we could see though, the game was just a big room with spooky images lining the walls. Allegedly, the game had the ability to do things such as reset your password without you knowing. All of the accounts of these alleged- Bro, this was the first Roblox hackers ever! 
Dude, this is the first Roblox hackers. This is crazy. Scenarios happening are now very old and only word of mouth. So it's safe to say that all of this was a hysterical hoax in the nicher sides of the veteran Roblox community. What this whole ordeal had me interested in though, is the prospect that this may be the very first documented ARG that happened inside of the game. A form of gaining attention for something that we'd see pop up a lot more frequently way past the game's release. The owner of the Spirit account even being the same person who ran the minigame world. Meaning that all of this was just a very elaborate self-promotion stunt for his own game. A strategy that, I'd say at least, was very- Wait, so the developer of the game hacked his own game so that people would go play the game to see what the hackers are doing. And it's actually just the developer hacking his own game to get players- That's smart. That's smart. ...of its time. This story is largely forgotten in the broader scale of what the horror subgroup on Roblox would end up spiraling into, but I do think it's still worth bringing up for the reasons previously listed. As the years went on, we'd see this formula evolve far past this 2007 stunt, accumulating in several urban legends John, that would pop no! up as a result. Although all of these stories are somewhat interesting in their own right, they really weren't anything but hysteria catered to spook very impressionable children who, understandably, don't know next to any anything about how code or hacking works. Although I'm not all that interested in going into extensive detail on how these stories came to be, what I am interested in covering is the characters that would come out of these stories. John Doe was so popular, like, you, do, you guys don't understand. Like, he was so popular that even people that didn't play Roblox were asking what's going on with John Doe. Like, I had a friend, he was a Call of Duty streamer back in, like, 2017. He called me up, he's like, bro, what is going on with this John Doe Roblox stuff? And I had to explain that it's, like, a fake hacker in Roblox. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> Crazy! 1x1x1 and John Doe. Around the time of Roblox's former peak in popularity, mascot horror started to become something very prevalent in the indie horror scene. Being pioneered by FNAF and spawning many others, it I started love to become Tattletail. apparent that the way to go around marketing a setup like this is character first, story second. The most interesting part being about these two Roblox entities is that their urban legend status wasn't spearheaded by Roblox itself. It also got so big that Roblox themselves had to issue a statement telling everyone that John Doe was fake. I'd show you guys, but they they deleted the blog post. But they made a blog post saying that John Doe is actually fake. You're not going to get hacked. Like, it got so big. If anything, they tried to suppress it when they thought it was getting out there of There it hand. is! Yeah, the yeah, yeah. What drove these characters to become the legends that they were was the community. As time went on, a narrative was being built around these two accounts secretly being controlled by some super hackers who supposedly would destroy Roblox on March 8th of 2017. Although an obviously fake story that the Roblox company would have to debunk a week after the supposed date, the lingering effects of these Roblox accounts and the explosion of mascot horror would start to change the landscape of popular horror games once more. And with this newfound popularity, it piqued my interest in three games that seem to follow this trend on the surface. The three games I'm looking to cover today are Piggy, yep. Doors, and Rainbow Friends. Okay. All these games at face value seem to follow a similar criteria. Horror games with the specific goal of catering to a younger audience, with character designs that appeal to that crowd. After I review all these games, I want to be able to answer if they have merit to stand on their own legs themselves, or if they continue to change the landscape of indie horror games in a less than favorable direction. With all of that being said though, let's start with the oldest of the bunch. Piggy, here we go, oh my god. So I genuinely had no idea what to expect when going into this game. I've seen a couple of clips from cutscenes before, but nothing about the actual game itself. What I can tell you though, is that I didn't expect Dead by Daylight with rounds that end with needless lore expeditions. At my first glance, Piggy's biggest problem is the fact that you just do not know what's going on. Nothing of what you are doing in it makes sense. Piggy, like, I feel like in order to enjoy Piggy, you had to be there as the chapters were coming out. Like, would you guys agree? Like, now that everything's out, everything's just kind of jumbled together. So, like, in order to, in order to enjoy it, you really, you had to be there. Like, you had to be there chapter by chapter. I, I, I think, at least because it's all just randomly assigned rounds. Most players on this game have probably been playing for a while already, so despite my numerous times on trying to get the matches in order, I just couldn't. I got a few games on chapter one, so I know how everything starts, but the next thing I know I'm on chapter eight and I'm looking for someone named Mr. P. Like, how the hell did we get here? This problem wouldn't even be nearly as egregious as- It's fine, it's fine. No, I, I didn't hear anything. You, got, you guys hear anything? 
Did you guys hear anything? I didn't hear anything. I didn't, I didn't hear anything. It was if there was just a single player mode. Okay, a short correction. There is a single player mode. This. I figured out that you can actually play single player mode through private servers, but I still stand by my point that you should be able to simply toggle single player mode in the menu. This chapter selection design does- That's a problem with Roblox. You can't- That's- It's just how Roblox works. Either you have public servers or you have private servers. Like, there is no- there is no like in between it's not fit the game if it wants to be heavily story driven trying to play single player mode also made me realize how bad the ai is in this game it's never not off your trail to the point where it gets stuck on collision constantly this game is definitely built for multiplayer in mind as this issue is far less noticeable of a group rather than solo but i honestly would expect one of the most visited roblox games of all time to have better optimization for this play style but i digress Anyways, the gameplay itself is all the AI gets much better in book two In book one. The AI is pretty bad. Yeah, right. It has Roblox charm to it while also bringing aspects of multiplayer survival horror into the mix. I will say, though, that the players who get assigned as the killers in these games suck. Usually there's only one exit on the map. So a common problem I saw throughout some of my matches were players just setting traps right by the exit. Some of the times I was able to juke them despite their barricades, though. So that was kind of funny. I really showed that nine year old playing against me. Piggy's gameplay loop works for short bursts of entertainment, but it gets repetitive really fast. There's this arbitrary 10 minute countdown for every round, which if you're a new player like me and don't know exactly how to navigate some of these confusing maps, makes no sense to implement. You aren't just allowed to join a new game if you die too, you have to wait for the round to end that you are in, which is also just a very poor design choice. Systems like this will be seen throughout- That's- that's a problem with Roblox, like you can't- they're- they're- there's no way to just switch servers like that, to my knowledge. Like, that's that's just a limitation of how Roblox works, unfortunately. All the games we play in this video, but I personally feel that Piggy handles it the absolute worst. If you could just join different lobbies after you die, the time limit wouldn't even need to be a thing. The progression of levels is very forced too, it's mainly just collecting keys that open doors or safes that give you another key to open in another area. With there being such a lack of variety with the assets, you'll see a lot of them reused in a lot of the levels. Levels. Some of them will have unique assets to them, but they are used so trivially that you don't really notice them when shoved in with all the repetitiveness of the same key and plank being used in every- I think if they use different items for every chapter, it would get very confusing. Like, everyone knows that a purple key goes to a purple door, you know? So, like, if you see the purple key, then- I, I mean the safe. So, if you know- if you see a purple key, you know there's gonna be a purple safe, right? Or if you see a red key, you know there's gonna be a red door. Um, I, 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 I kind of like that. Every single map. So even though the gameplay is repetitive, what is the driving thing to the story? One of the biggest games on the entire site. It's the story. Piggy by far is the largest horror game on the site, having an absurd. Audience. Like the story is the best part about Piggy. Hundred and ten percent. Nobody would disagree with me. It is the best part about Piggy hands down 11 billion visits making it the fifth most played game on the program ever a feat that i'd imagine is not that easy to accomplish the game's popularity allowed it to even get big enough for the developers to start selling physical merchandise of it in stores merchandise that i've seen stocked in malls and other stores with toys in them alike i guess they just don't really sell that well looking past how the game actually plays the game's premise is also very strange i made the dead by daylight comparison earlier because of its multiplayer component Component, but a more accurate comparison would be a granny. cross between Granny, another children catered horror game that blew up for how accessible it was, being made as a mobile app instead of a PC or console game, and Peppa Pig. It took me a while to understand why this, such a mind-numbingly niche premise would be so appealing to children. But looking back at all of the media that come from the early 2010s to now, it finally clicked. The concept may seem incredibly strange at first, but when you think about it, it makes complete sense. There's another trend that spawned from the whole horror for kids Sonic EXE grow over the past decade. One where children seem to be obsessed with the idea of media actually catered to their demographic to becoming corrupt and dark and evil. This predates a lot of what we even talked about up until this point creepypasta characters like sonic.exe started to explode he didn't say the story man he didn't say the story like again you had to be there you had to be there man i i think if you were a new uh, like a new piggy player today you probably wouldn't like the game because like the story's already out there and like so much of the fun of it 
was figuring out the story week by week. Like, what's going to happen next week? What's going to happen this week? Who's that? Who's this? What new character is this? So, yeah, I... Yeah. Creating a phenomenon that would only get bigger as time went on. There were several examples of what I'd like to call EXEification pop up as years went by, ultimately peaking, I'd say, in the last two years. Piggy, although not being the conclusion of this decadal buildup, this is where I'd say it has certainly peaked. Turning one of the most popular children's phenomenons to come out of the last decade into this spooky parody while still being catered to kids makes complete sense. Children, especially older children, don't like feeling that they are being marketed to their own crowd. I feel as a way to still enjoy something childish while feeling mature in the process is by consuming media of these corrupt versions of the characters that were made for them. And for that, we will continue to see game makers and content creators continue to lean into this, and it seems that it will only get larger as time goes on. This, I feel, is the thesis that I've been missing this entire time. One that explains the entire trend perfectly and why it's so successful. It makes me want to check out even more of these games. Maybe somewhere in there we could- DON'T find CALL THE ROCK AT 3 A.M. I mean, I feel like he's right. Like, Piggy does have a very basic gameplay. Like, compared to something like Doors, it's a very basic game. But the story is what makes it so interesting. So, I-, I he wouldn't know that because he's playing it once all the story is out, so there's no way for him to know that, so I don't blame him, but- I, I, I do think the story was the, uh, was the big thing that does it better than the rest. A game that actually feels like it has passion behind its premise and not made with just the intention of knowing kids will eat it up no matter what. I care about the medium of horror gaming a lot, and I feel that there has to be some people using this tool to make their projects that do too. And honestly, I think I found it. Is it Doors? Yeah, Doors, man, here we go. Chapter 3, Doors. Oh, it's about to get good. Here I we go. I honestly don't even really know where to begin with this one. Doors doesn't feel like a Roblox game in the slightest. If the game didn't render your entire body, I'd genuinely be convinced that this was some Unity demo somewhere in the depths of Steam or itch.io, which may sound like low praise at first, but when compared to what you're used to in this program, it's actually pretty impressive. Doors has a very, very simple premise. The game has you walking through doors. The more doors you go through, the more likely you are to encounter random hostile entities as you pass through. Now, this may come as a shocker, but this concept isn't solely original. If anything, it was done- Doors is actually based on another Roblox game, but- they did it way better. It's better almost 10 years ago with the game Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. Despite all that though, I can't help but label this game as my favorite out of all the three we are going to discuss today. And there are a ton of reasons as to why. First off, although the assets may seem a bit limited at first, every room in this game- Y'all wanna know why Doris is my favorite Roblox game right now? Same as this guy? It's just fun. It's just a fun game. Like, every time you play it, it's a little bit different. The rooms are different. The The monsters come at you earlier or maybe later. Or, or maybe you get three rushes in a row. Maybe you get an ambush on door two. Like, it's just, it's a fun game. I love it. It's just, it's just straight up fun. Although repetitive at times, sincerely feels like it was crafted with care and passion. Doors has a very consistent theme when compared to the game's main inspiration and even compared to other games we'll cover. Every room is based off the architecture of vintage Victorian style hotels, a type of architecture popular in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. This atmosphere, although I personally believe it's not the scariest, for what it's trying to achieve it certainly plays in its favor. It reminds me more of Luigi's Mansion 3 or any subsequent game in that Dude, I love Luigi's Mansion! Oh my god! I love this game! Oh, this is one of my favorite games on the GameCube. I feel so old. This game is so much fun. More than it does like FNAF or Poppy Playtime. It really sets it apart from a lot of these other games that go for a much more industrial or sci-fi approach to its setting, and I can certainly appreciate that. Doors, I feel, is also definitely the most replayable game on this list. Instead of a fetch quest system that we saw with Piggy, and we'll also unfortunately see more in a little bit with the third entry, this game is certainly more straightforward than that. With your objective 
of being very clear. Get to door 100. Now, in some ways, this may sound like a bad thing, and honestly, I can certainly understand how it can be interpreted that way. But the way it's tackled and other subsequent strategies you can do to progress certainly make this experience more engaging as time goes on. The game isn't designed to have you beat it your first try blind. Sure, it may be possible, but with the currency you can find to buy items that can help you in future rounds, on top of hints that you are given after you die, the game is designed to have you learn through trial and error. This system honestly reminds me of how roguelikes are designed, strangely enough. On top of the fact that every single room is randomly generated outside of very scripted ones, it certainly seems that doors- You know, I can't think of another Roblox game that has randomly generated, like, maps. Like, not a single one. I don't I don't think there's another Roblox game that does it. Like they're they they were the first one. I could be wrong, but I think Let's take at least a little bit of inspiration from that genre. I personally believe this may be what separates doors from your average spooky hallway walking scene. Rooms? Is rooms randomly generated? I mean, I don't know if that counts. The obstacles are pretty self-explanatory most of the time you encounter one. If you enter a room and the lights start flickering, that means you need to get to the closest hiding spot to avoid Rush, a PNG that, well, rushes into the room. If you get caught before you hide, then your run comes to an end. Rush also has this rare variant to it called Ambush, which functions practically the same but will boomerang back in the direction that it came from, incentivizing you to hide longer. The second most common entity is Screech, a face that appears in pitch dark rooms. Whenever you hear a sound, it means dart your mouse around <gasps> as fast as possible and click its face. Failure to do so will make Screech attack you, taking away a very significant portion you don't of actually your health have to, and maybe- You don't actually have to click the face, you just have to look at it even killing you. These guys will usually be the main foes that you encounter throughout playing. You'll sometimes encounter others like Eyes, whose gimmick is that you're not supposed to look at them, and the scariest entity of all, There's a few rare entities thrown in there too, but you might not even encounter them on your first time playing. So I'll leave those guys as a surprise to you all. Go play the game yourself and see if you can find them. Or just look up the encounters on YouTube, I don't know. There's one more entity before the big one that I want to talk about, who shows up at around the 30 door mark. The walls will start to get infested by eyes, some you can see darting around your screen, until you enter a big corridor, and this happens. Seek. Seek is a completely scripted entity, much like the next one we are going to talk about. But unlike that one, I actually think this one is ex Dude, Seek was so scary the first time you encounter him. Like, you, you, you just played the game, you don't know what's going on, you don't know anything about it, you're playing it for the first time, and all of a sudden this giant man comes out of a portal, and he's like- <laughs> And you're like- <laughs> You know, like, it, it's great. Executed incredibly well. Your objective for when you encounter Seek is to just run. With many obstacles and looping corridors lining your path for the next 10 or so rooms, encountering Seek for the first time feels like a major event. It's yeah. a heavy palate cleanser from the more slow burn and quiet rooms that we have gotten used to up until this point. On top of the fast paced and energetic soundtrack, compared to the rain ambience that we've gotten so used to, this won't be the last time Doors uses its soundtrack to build a scene. But as I've mentioned, it's certainly my favorite. We then close the door on Seek and head another few rooms until we get to the first real boss of the game, Figure. You know what I want him to do? Whenever a new update comes out, I want him to replace the library part. Um, th This right here. I, I think one big problem I have with the game is every time it's the library. What if there was like three monsters and it randomly picked one. So maybe it would be the library one time, but maybe next time it's something else. And then maybe next time it's something else. So that way you don't get the library every single time. And there's something different and unique basically every time you play it. I think that'd be a good idea. Figure. Look, I know what this boss fight was trying to do, but it was just not executed that well, I think. Figure functions like the liquor from the Resident Evil does. A blind monster that can hear or you walk around unless you're crouching, and also interact with objects. Alright, so this is your objective when you enter this room. You need to find all the colored books on the bookshelves that match a puzzle in a note, which in turn gives you a code to unlock the door in the front. You got that? Because I certainly did it my first time playing. Figure's pathfinding is also very 
very annoying. He doesn't stop moving and he goes really fast. So even if you're crouching and he's right in front of you, that's about it. You can't really do anything about that. You can maybe run to a closet to hide in and it gives you this little mini game prompt. But there's no give or take that you'll even be able to make it there in time. But after trial and error and more error, I was finally able to get past this guy. Phew, I hope I don't have to do that again. Oh god damn it. Ah! After another 50 door I didn't hear anything. You guys hear anything? I didn't I didn't I didn't hear anything. You got hey, hey did you hear anything? No? I didn't I didn't hear anything. There was no was nothing there. No. No, okay. Okay. I I, I didn't I didn't I didn't hear anything. What I, I no doors of about the same thing but on a higher difficulty. You finally make it to the end, but look who's there waiting for you. This ending sequence in some ways is worse than the library. At least in the library- you I actually like the ending sequence. I think it's really good. ...to move around in. Here, if you don't know what you're doing the first time, you will be instantly killed by figure once again at- Oh, that's not what you're supposed to do. Oh, he doesn't know what you're supposed to do. So running right past him is actually not what you're supposed to do. Um. That's actually a glitch that everyone does. What you actually have to do, I don't know if the creator will ever see this video, but you actually, you're supposed to run back and hide in the other room, uh, in, in the closets in the other room, and then he'll run out of that room, and then you'll be safe to go forward. You're not actually supposed to run run by him. That's That's actually not supposed to happen at the very end. But I will say, finally getting to the end and getting that to be continued screen with the remix version of the lobby theme playing was a feeling like no other. That's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Doris is also going to run on a chapter by chapter release structure. Every game in this video will. I've already made it clear that I'm not the biggest fan of this release structure before, but for a small studio using a program that heavily encourages live updates, I can get behind it. I don't fault any of the creators for using this release structure for this type of program. I just think that it could be handled better in some instances. But I do think Doors does it pretty well. There have already been some teasers for the next update, and it looks pretty yeah. promising so far. It's been in development for quite some time now, and is scheduled to release sometime soon. Altogether, this is one of the most impressive gains I have seen come out of this program. Yeah. Its visuals and environments will make you forget that you're even playing a Roblox game sometimes. It's insane to me to think of how much is possible in this software, and to imagine that this game may not even be pushing its limits too. After this, there's nowhere to go but up, right? To make it to you. Is he gonna talk about Rainbow Friends next? Oh man, Rainbow Friends. I have I have such a love-hate relationship with this game. Like I love this game, but I don't like this game, but I love it, but I don't like it. Like, oh, I'm so interested in what he's gonna say. Well, just like how the elevator brought us all the way down at the end of doors, we are going to have to lower our standards once again tremendously for this one. Rainbow Friends just feels like a hodgepodge of a ton of things done by other successful properties on and off Roblox that makes it straight up- Rainbow Friends does feel like Dollar General Poppy Playtime. It kinda does. Because like you're collecting items, you got the blocks, you got like the toy factory thing going on shameless at times. The game takes it back to much more familiar territory, being structured more like Piggy, but having the runtime of doors. This, fortunately, makes it the easiest to review out of the three, but far, far from the most fun. I feel like there was a slight difficulty curve that was hard to gauge with doors and Piggy, with Piggy being somewhat confusing to new players and doors actually being a fairly challenging experience throughout its entire runtime. With Rainbow Friends, the skill ceiling is so unimaginably low that I could probably give an end the controller and they'll be rainbow friends is probably the easiest horror game on roblox like you can literally outrun blue like it's not hard at all it's very easy and if you die i'm pretty sure you can like pay to win it back like you can just respawn if you pay robux i think be able to beat it in the first few games. Like, like, there's I know you can't with Doors, but you can only do it once on Doors. I think you just do it forever on Rainbow yeah, Friends. I can somewhat respect Rainbow Friends for it's the fact that they are undoubtedly the most self-aware of their target demographic. Sure, Piggy is as well, but I go back. What was that? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Or it's the fact that they are undoubtedly the most self-aware of their. What the heck is going? on here. 
target demographic. Sure, Piggy is as well, but I feel like there had been a point in time where Piggy may have been with some passion around it at some point. With Rainbow Friends, you can tell that this game was built to go viral overnight and please everybody. With there already being stockpiles of unofficial merch coming out of the woodwork. Dude, my dog, I got my dog one of these and he loves purple. He'll literally chew purple like all night. I don't know where he is. I think he's in the stairway, but I literally have one. So like this game I have them all. He blew up three months ago. How did these people work so fast? Anyways, I feel like I'm criticizing too many things surrounding the game rather than the game itself. A lot of the things I listed aren't even the fault of the developers. So ramblings aside, how is Rainbow Friends as an experience? The game starts with you in a lobby, which doesn't have any invisible borders. Anyway, the starting area has you in front of an elementary school, with a bus ready to take you and a party of 15 on a field trip to a place called Oddworld. But on the way there, a spooky hand changes the direction of where the bus is supposed to go, making it drive into a trap, destroying the bus and dragging all the unconscious attendees away. When we wake up, we are told by this shadow figure that we need to find all of his blocks and stack them back up. And the game begins! This design takes the fetch quest style of Piggy and somehow dumps it down even further than there. I mean, there are positives to this system as opposed to Piggy though. At least your objective is very straightforward and articulated to you, and there's no arbitrary time limit in when you need to do things, so I'll give it that. Despite that though, Rainbow Friends Night 1, without exaggeration, is the most mindless and autopilot I have ever been playing a video game. It is up there with Sonic Forces and how little I need to think when I play this game. I've said this for a long time. I'll say it again. I think... I think Rainbow Friends has, like, the lowest age demographic of, like, all these games. Like, if you look at Doors... It's mostly played by, like, kids and older kids, right? Rainbow Friends is probably, like, Lanky Box audience to kids. So it's, like, Lanky Box audience, kids, older kids, right? Like, it, it, they're over here. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, yeah, I, I like the game, but, yeah, there are some things that could be better. I will admit there are some things that could be better. So, before I completely rip into it, I want to list all the positives I have with this game first. Because believe it or not, I think there are a lot of things that this game does pretty well. First off- I think the game would be so good if they actually updated the game, man, but they haven't said anything. The last thing they said was two months ago! Two and a half! Facility where everything takes place, although small, is very well designed and extremely aesthetically pleasing in a lot of areas. If there's one strength that this game certainly has, it's its art design. I think everything except for the monsters in this game look pretty impressive. You can tell a lot of care did go into making this environment, and to a point, it was actually pretty fun to explore. There's other attention to detail that I like, such as the doors opening actually having an animation where you push them open that I also do appreciate. This game also puts the AI and Piggy to shame. You can actually lose the monsters after a bit of it chasing you. Although I think it loses your trail a little bit too easily. I can imagine- You can do that in Piggy Book 2, but Piggy Book 1 has the old AI system, so yeah. Making super dynamic AI in Roblox of all things is not the easiest thing to do, so I'll let it slide a little. This is one area of the game I would really like to see updated though. Blue, yes, the name of the monster is literally just the color of the character, can be lost off of you in the matter of one turn of the corner. It's so easy to lose him that the only time I've ever died to it was trying to exploit its AI. Not to mention that in this game, you are literally given a portable hiding spot in the form of a solid snake box. And just as long as you don't deploy it literally two feet away from Blue's line of sight, you can literally just turn a corner and hide and it'll be none the wiser. Like, there are just no stakes- Where'd the player go? I don't know! <laughs> in this game. Despite that though, somehow more than half of your entire team will die on night one, only having you and around four other people able to find the blocks and return them to the stage. And if you can't find them in a certain time, the game will just highlight where they are on the map. I swear, this game needs a hard mode that you can select or something. First off, it's not designed as if 15 people can be dropped into here. It would work much better as a game with a squad of four because that's practically what you'll be 
left with after every ending of round one. The game is just way too easy in this phase, and honestly, it doesn't really get much harder. Every night, a new gimmick is introduced to make things more challenging. On night two, you're introduced to a new character named Green, another monster that'll roam the halls as you look for dog food. The thing that separates <laughs> Green from Blue is that he can't see, so it's a lot harder for him to detect you. I wonder if we find this out through- oh, it's just told to us. The shadowy figure tells us that he's blind before we start. Yeah. No, no cue that they can't see, like your first encounter with figure indoors. You're just told he can't see. Apparently, he can't hear as well because you can literally run right past this guy with no consequence at all. The only thing that makes Green even a little remotely more the boxes don't work. Blue is the fact that you can't sneak by him while you're in your box, making him more a wall that can kill you if you get too close to it rather than an actual enemy that you really need to worry about. But regardless, you find all the dog food and you put it on the stage and you get thrown into night three. And not just one, but two gimmicks are introduced here. Yeah. You get the introduction of a new orange cake. Type in the chat who your favorite enemy is in the game. I, I would say mine is probably purple because I, I, I think it's the most unique one. And I think, I think purple is actually scary. Like if you're getting chased and you see purple and like you can't run across the vent, it's like, do I turn around or do I risk going across the water? You know, I really like purple. Character. Guess what his name is. It will run around the entire facility if you don't fill up his food bowl periodically. And the game was nice enough to map out the exact path it's going to run around so you don't get caught by him. There are just so many decisions here that don't make any sense to me. Like, why is this needed? Can there be some challenge thrown in here? I'm sorry, but this is straight up pathetic to me. You can hear Orange running around when he's close to you, and they could have used that to their advantage if you were going to cross paths with him and maybe give you more of an incentive to use your portable hiding spot, but no. The game just has to hold your hand through that too. This makes Orange not have any challenge at all. I didn't even- He looks like a Dorito. He, he looks like a Dorito. You know, like a, like an orange Dorito. With legs. Like somebody squished an orange Dorito. And they gave him arms and arm. Ar ar I can't even talk. Arms and legs. Orange not have any challenge at all. I didn't even bother trying to refill his food bowl because I had no incentive to do so. He's so easily avoidable that you can just stay out of his way entirely while you. I didn't even know you could refill his food bowl until like twenty times I've played the game. Like, they, like you, they, I did. I had no idea. Look around for the next item you need to bring on stage. Oh yeah, did I mention that there is another monster introduced on Oh, the I night? love purple. So like purple guy FNAF is in the vents and you need to walk around the puddles leaking from it or something. Anyways, night four. The fuses that you put he didn't in like the purple. panels last night <laughs> overloaded the power of the facility, so now we need to find nine AA batteries in the dark to turn the power back on. I will say the darkness actually does add some ambience to the facility a bit. Shining your light on blue or green when you're walking around actually made me jump a few times as much as I don't want to admit that. Wait, what's this in settings? High quality flashlight can be enabled off. Okay, I'm sorry. This is just shameless. <laughs> I have nothing else to say about this. I All didn't right, even so know you could do that. You could just make it bright, man. You could just make it bright. Leading night four brings you to the final night. The shadow you know why that's in the game? That's in the game for people on really low quality phones. Because I'm pretty sure you can play Roblox on like an iPod from like 2006. So that's actually not in the game to make it easier. That's in the game to make it so that the guy with the iPad or the iPod from 2006 can play the game. The figure says that there's a celebration waiting for you, and once it's over, our character gets to leave. We're actually taken to a whole new map for this segment. After doing a very basic movement puzzle, you're taken to the exit door, but it's not over yet. As one balloon pops, waking blue, in the next room, you need to do a physics puzzle and drop a plank down to enter into a vent chase sequence. Yes, I know what you're all thinking. We'll get to that. Poppy playtime. Anyways, you get to the end of the very simple vent chase and we escape. The game ends with the shadow figure being revealed to be a red guy. A he fish! He for a bit and then the game ends. Phew. So that was Rainbow Friends. Can we take a moment to discuss how uninspired all of that was? As harsh as this is going to sound, Rainbow Friends, I think, just brings absolutely nothing to the table. It's hard to even hate on it, as there's so little to love or hate. It just makes me feel entirely apathetic. Everything from the shallow-looking characters to the painstakingly easy gameplay, down to their set pieces, make this feel like a collection of things that I've already done- I'll say this, you know how I used to play Piggy every single day? 
like in 2020. Like I played it every single day. Like the like theories and videos and stuff. There is no way I could play Rainbow Friends every single day. I would, I would lose my mind. There is no way. Like that's what that's all I'll say about it. Like it's, I love the game for what it is, but I could not play it every single day. There's no way. Better products. Let's take the vent chase at the end, for example, which we all know is supposed to be a homage to the ending of Poppy Playtime Chapter One. Compare both sequences. Despite how I've articulated my feelings on Poppy Playtime in the past, the vent chase sequence is an objectively great part of that game. Huggy Wuggy is never out of your sight as you desperate. This is top five scary moments in any video game for me, and I, I'm not ashamed to admit it. This part is literally scary. Try to make your way past the trick doors and dead ends of the vents. He is always right behind you, making his presence very clear and very threatening. There are actual stakes in the scene, and whether you think it's scary or not is completely irrelevant here. What matters is this scene is actually really engaging to the player and makes the payoff at the end truly feel eventful. In Rainbow Friends, you don't even see Blue chasing you through the vents, and walking through them is the most anti- Wait, does he not actually chase you through the vents? I've never actually stopped and looked behind me. Does he not actually go through the vent? No! He does? I actually have no idea. I, I, I don't even remember. Anticlimactic ending imaginable. I genuinely waited seven seconds at the very end to see if he even spawned in. It takes him seven seconds to even remotely catch up to you. And yes, I get it. Poppy Playtime is a game designed by a whole team of animators and professionals to create something that is going to be way leaps and bounds over what Roblox will ever dream to be capable of. But if you're going to shamelessly rip off an already pretty mediocre game and get one six of the world- I, 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 I like Poppy Playtime a lot. I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that. I like the game a lot. Especially, um, um, yeah. This entire population in visits to your project with no updates on this scene, I think it opens you up to criticism. Rainbow Friends is literally the final boss of mascot horror. If I thought Poppy Playtime was soulless last year, this game makes that look like the second coming of Christ in playable form. I understand I shouldn't have my standards set as high as they are for Roblox of all things, but after playing Doors and having- I think the jump scares could be way better too. ...to go through this, I'm not sure honestly. I know I've been pretty needlessly hard on this game, but when you get the popularity this big for a project and just decide not to improve on it and rather just focus on adding on things, I think you'd be in your right- They haven't added on anything. That's not even a real trailer. Oh, he thinks that's a real trailer. That's not even a real trailer. There's no update. There's no update trailer. He thinks that's the real one. That's not the real one. No, no, no to criticize things that you don't There's like no about update. the product. This game might have potential in the coming chapters, but as things stand right now, this game feels like straight up cannon fodder and nothing more unfortunately. So, Conclusion. We look okay. At the good the bad, and the ugly of Roblox horror games. I think I've come out of this experience learning a lot more from my initial criticisms of horror games for kids almost a year ago. Although my mindset on the whole thing hasn't changed all that much, I do think I have a much better understanding as to why it works so well. I mean, it caught my interest all those years ago, so it's no surprise that it has continued to evolve or devolve depending on how you want to look at it as the years went by. With how much more accessible Roblox is compared to a a lot of these other mascot horror games, which are usually locked to the PC only, it's no surprise that these games, which can be played on virtually any modern piece of hardware, would be as lucrative as they are. And honestly, I'm kind of okay with it being confined in this little area that it is. Even though it seems absolutely- We gotta play Don't Call the Rock at 3 a.m., dude. ...can get popular in this oversaturated corner of video games, once in a while, it seems like something will come over from here that actually does really surprise you. And I personally I personally do think that all of the fodder in between is worth rummaging through, if it means that the ones that are very clearly made with love and passion have more of a chance to be brought to the top. Despite my criticisms brought to all of these games, I don't want to see any of them fail. I wanted to leave this video, potentially learning about something for a niche of horror gaming I was never really all that familiar with. And I just hope that what I said here today meant something to some developers out there. As tempting as it seems to follow trends, make something quick and easy, and gain a following and profit for
for it. Sometimes it does mean something to put a bit more effort into your project, and I feel that these three examples are proof of that. Maybe I'll come back to Roblox another day to explore what they got over here. I bet I could find some more truly great things to cover over here one day. Uh, oh, Purophobia! Uh, the Mimic! Those two are really good, especially the Mimic! little experiment surely has and a pyrophobia especially both of those my interest but we can save that for another time for now i think it's time to sign off i've been dags and until next time see ya i'll have a link to the video down in the description to the to the creator himself um i, I think that was a pretty good video does he even do like roblox stuff oh he doesn't even do like roblox stuff he just does like general Ro like horror stuff so that's that was a good video. That was a good video. Yeah, I'll have a link to his channel down below. Go go check it out. That was a uh that was a very very good video. Yeah, that was good.